Hi, welcome back to Live and Breathe Horses and we're going on with this wonderful collection of stories about Tom Dorrance put together by Margaret Dorrance and John St Ryan in this beautiful book, More Than a Horseman. And today's story comes from Randy Leighton. I think it's Leighton, could be Leighton. I met Bill Dorrance in my early teens. That began my introduction to this philosophy of handling horses and livestock. Then a few years later came the introduction to Ray Hunt. I spent quite a few years cowboying and starting colts with Ray. Ray told me this was a way of life, not a method of training. Ray spoke of Tom often. I had met Tom in my teens when I was around Bill, but I really didn't know him and it was through Ray that I was exposed to Tom, particularly when Tom and Ray had clinics together. Then from time to time, I would meet up with Tom to get some help with horses I had in training. It didn't take me long to realise that this man was really special. In the 90s, I was able to spend quite a bit of time working with Tom and what Ray had told me early on about this being a way of life was becoming clear to me as I saw what Tom possessed. I had never to this day met anyone who had so much self-control and self-discipline as Tom did. He had such vision and compassion for not only horses but for all of life. Tom tried to get people to understand that less was more and if they did less they would achieve quicker and better results with their horses in the long run. Tom was assisting a young man with his mare. He described her to Tom as hurried in everything she did and wanted to do too much. As Tom watched him work with his mare, Tom asked him to ask a little less. So the young man attempted to do so, but the mare was still doing way more than any May, way more than was wanted. So again, Tom said, a little less. And the young man replied, I'm not doing anything. Tom replied, cut that in half. When we first saddled a colt, we would work the colt until he stood for the saddle. Once he was cinched up, Tom would have me take the halter off the colt and leave him in his tracks and allow him to move off on his own however long this took. If he bucked, if he ran, or if he walked off, it was always okay. After the colt had moved on his own, Tom would have you move him with the flag. What Tom wanted was for the colt to move free, smooth, even and balanced. In the beginning, they're rough and humpy. We just wait for all that to smooth out. It didn't matter which way the colt turned when he changed directions when we were flagging him. We tried not to chop him off, but just tried to let the colt slow down and change directions without too much tightness. If you force the change of direction or force the colt to face up to you, it creates more tightness. The whole object was to get the colt to relax so the transitions became smooth. Even when we caught the colts, we didn't force them to face up because as they relax and quit avoiding, they will face up. You don't have to make it happen. It will just happen. Sometimes we would unsaddle and resaddle and do the same process all over again if Tom thought that would benefit the colt. And other times we would unsaddle and that would be enough for the day. Tom was looking for the colts to relax and not be afraid. The approach varies from horse to horse. When I started a colt and the first time I would get on, if there was life in his feet and he wanted to go, Tom would have me go on with him. But if he didn't want to move, sometimes Tom would have me take his head around until a hind foot moved, then do that on the other side and keep repeating the process until the colt walked off. This usually didn't take too long, two or three tries, and the colt would walk off. Tom didn't want me to bring the colt's heads around to my knee to be petted. 
Whenever we brought the head around, it was to encourage or disengage the hind feet. The object wasn't to bring his head around, it was to affect the feet. However little that took is what we did. We tried not to get them too overbent. Only after they moved, Tom would have me start them with my legs. By bringing my legs out away from the colt, then bringing my legs into him softly, trying not to scare him. Calves touching first, then down to your spur. Tom would have me dig in with my spur until there was some response if the feet didn't release. Then pause and start again. After a few trials, the colts would walk off. Then you build from there. If you get a horse that has learned to get stuck, Tom would have me use the same process. If the horse would respond, that's good enough. If the horse was unresponsive, Tom would have me come in suddenly and sharply with my legs. Riders need to be prepared for consequences. Then Tom always had me work on the horse starting from behind. Tom always emphasised how important it was for a horse to start from behind. I admire Tom greatly and to this day he's still helping me to make changes. I will be working a horse and things he told me years ago will suddenly become clear. When Tom said it had taken him all his life to learn what he knew, it was so true. It's a constant learning process. I feel blessed and thankful for the time I was able to spend with him. The picture of a horseman he presented set the standards so high, although not easy to attain. He gave us all something to strive for. <sighs> Another inspiring story. Um, true story, of course. It seems weird saying stories, because they are stories, but stories sometimes I think it's something made up. So, um, yeah, anyway, legends perhaps. Thank you for joining me today. Keep tuning into the light, and I look forward to seeing you next time.